Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our advanced method webinar for today, an introduction to statistical disease cluster detection with health administrative data. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Rhonda Rosenschock. Uh, she is a professor and accredited professional statistician in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. She's also the lead biostatistician for the Canadian COVID-19 Emergency Department Rapid Response Network. Her research activities include statistical methods development, epidemiological studies, and collaboration and consultation with clinical colleagues. Her methods work has focused on disease cluster detection and recurrent events often applied in emergency department use. So without uh, further ado, I'll pass it over to Dr. Rosenchuk. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, thank you so much Anne for that introduction and uh, to the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm really excited to uh, talk to you about this um, area of interest that I've had. Uh, it actually doesn't have to do anything with COVID-19, which uh, for some of you may be disappointing, but for others might be uh, refreshing because a lot of us are working in that field uh, right now. And it's sometimes nice to talk about some other things. So let me just down. So my objectives today are to try to give you some motivation on the importance of examining spatial relationships and to discuss some key aspects of clustering studies. Most importantly, probably the geographic unit and the outcome. And I'm going to illustrate some of these methods using uh, Alberta Emergency Department data, administrative data that uh, I've used for quite a few different uh, projects over the years. And I'll talk a little bit about describing the challenges of interpretation for some of these analyses, especially when you use health services data. So first of all, um, what is spatial analysis? Well, processes have patterns and processes in space produce spatial patterns. So often the goals are to find the pattern and describe it and to understand the underlying process behind it. And the idea is that basically data with location information are spatial data and they, you think that closer data are more related or more correlated. So data that's closer together will be more related. Um, so with these kinds of analyses, we'll have different spatial uh, units that are also called like geographic units or geographic areas. In some contexts, you'll know the exact location, like the latitude and the longitude. Uh, sometimes you know streets, postal codes, or school districts, um, and maybe things are aggregated to those levels. And so we'll either have individual level data or aggregated data generally. And I'm going to focus on more of the aggregated data because often in the sort of health services or um, geographic analysis that I can do, I'm not able to get uh, individual level data for privacy reasons. And some of this can be at just one point in time or it can be over um, uh, a series of dates and times. In general, I'm just gonna talk about sort of one, one point in time. So there's many applications. Uh, Cressy's book in 1993 was probably a, a very comprehensive book at the time that really described all the different sort of approaches that you could do. And so you could think about things uh, like wind directions plotted on a map, uh, or you can think of the distribution of particles through a liquid or spatial variation in yield from agriculture plots. Um, maps of standardized mortality ratios by county, all kinds of different things because we live in uh, um, 3D and so space is always uh, can be a consideration. And so one of the jokes that if you're looking for statistical methodology uh, problems is you think about one thing and then, oh, but what if I made this spatial, right? So that you can think of uh, other interesting problems that you can solve. So there's a lot of aspects to this, and I'm not gonna go into details about all of these different ways you can analyze spatial data. I'm gonna be very focused in, in my talk today. Uh, so our motivation today is that we wanna identify and quantify 
patterns of disease in geographic areas. And so the basic um, reason for this is we believe that where these disease occurs can lead to a better understanding of why the disease occurs. And if we have a better understanding, then maybe we can formulate hypotheses or identify areas where we can target further investigations. We might be able to identify exposures and risk factors, and we might be able to uh, do things like develop interventions and know where to deploy them. And probably the most famous example, and I mean, every epidemiology student uh, knows of the 1954 study of Wanda's cholera epidemic. Uh, and so this is like probably a very good early example of spatial analysis because in that situation, snow basically mapped to some wells where the cholera epidemic uh, was happening. And that is the kind of sort of um, idealized goal of any of our spatial analyses that we hope that we're, you know, identifying something that is caused uh, by some spatial um, contaminant or some something that, that is related to a certain location and then we can be able to solve it. So when we talk about statistical cluster detection tests, we're trying to identify spatial or temporal clusters or both, um, usually in an automatic way without local reports. So what's a local report? Well, if somebody says, you know, three people on my street have received a cancer diagnosis um, uh, for, for brain cancer in the last, you know, month. There's something going on here, you know, that kind of thing. That would be what a local report would be. Um, we want to be able to do that without, we want to be able to do analyses and identify clusters without uh, requiring a local report because basically there may not be anybody who knows that information to say, oh, there's something going on here. Uh, you don't want to have to result, re be reliant on observant clinicians or observant uh, lab tech people or observant neighbors. And so we need methodologically sound and objective methods to do this kind of thing. And often we want things to be done in a timely way and in an inexpensive way, which is especially the case that, that can happen with administrative data. We don't have to go out and create a whole new data infrastructure and data collection to go find things if we can use administrative data. And so I'll talk a little bit now about the application I'm going to use to sort of illustrate some of these methods. And so basically, um, one of the goals that I had earlier uh, in my work was to identify um, areas with high rates of disease and or high rates of disease related events. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, what the difference is between uh, sort of the disease and the events in a little bit. But I'll first just say a little bit of background that emergency departments often face overcrowding and serve marginalized populations. And so one of the projects that I wanted to look at was to look at children and youth, so people who are under age 18, age 18 years when they present to the emergency department and their presentations are for substance use. And so these substances can be uh, drugs, alcohol, any of that sort of um, thing. And then the idea would be that if, okay, we can detect clusters, we can help target interventions to reduce um, substance use presentations in the ED. Um, emergency department care is relatively expensive. And when we have crowding, we wanna be able to safely reduce uh, presentations and, and ultimately um, help people so that they don't need to be presenting there to begin with. Um, so I'm not too sure where everyone is uh, logging in from here, but uh, here's a map of Canada and I'm in Edmonton and the study is in Alberta, so neighbors to British Columbia and Saskatchewan. And I'll talk a little bit about our, our data sources. So um, in Alberta, we have a provincial uh, health authority that is the care holder for um, all of our administrative data. 
uh, much like other provinces. And so the Alberta Healthcare Insurance Plan provides all this information about the population. It's got all the registry file. So we have some geographic regions, uh, some things about the people, like the age at the fiscal year end, uh, so uh, sex, and uh, socioeconomic proxy, which I don't think I actually use in, in what I'm going to show you, but we had some of these, these kind of things available at the time. And then at the time of this data, we were the ambulatory care classification system, which was just uh, an Alberta system, but now we in Alberta for all emergency department presentations report to um, NACR, the National Ambulatory Care Classification System. Um, so, so this is just like prior to the, the initiation of that aspect. So what do we know about these ED visits? We know things like the diagnostic codes, the international classification of diseases codes that are, that are used, the ICD-10 um, codes, um, the start end of an emergency department visit, uh, how the person left from the ED, were they admitted, were they discharged, all these good things. And so I should also say that this uh, study is part of Alberta Health and uh, they don't um, are using data from Alberta Health and they do not uh, necessarily um, agree or have an opinion or, or anything with related to, to what I'm going to show you. All right, so what are some of our definitions? Well, first thing we, we define are our cases. So these would be the people that or the subjects that have the disease or illness under our consideration. So in this case, we're looking at people with at least one substance use uh, presentation to the emergency department. And so each person or each uh, individual could have multiple presentations during a calendar year, which I believe is what this uh, data are about, then the um, number of presentations or the individual presentations can be considered as events. And so these are disease or illness related events. And then another terminology that's common in the sort of cluster detection literature or spatial analysis is a cell. So this is what's the smallest geographic administrative area with data available, or um, sometimes you call it just area, but generally we'll, we'll call it cell. And in this case, I'm going to use Alberta sub-regional health authorities, and I'll show you a picture of what those are um, in a little bit. And then the cluster is what we would say one or more cells with more cases if we're doing uh, case based clustering or more events. Uh, if we're doing events based clustering than expected by chance. And so in our case, this will be one or more Alberta sub regional health authorities SRHAs. And so um, for those people who are interested in administrative data and health services. Uh, you might recognize already that there could be sort of a difference between um, people having uh, or the cases versus the events because you could have um, some people that have a lot of events and some people that um, maybe don't have as many events. And so this sort of interpretation is giving you a, a little a sneak peek could be potentially be different about what happens when you find a cluster of, of these two different um, aspects. All right, so here, oops, press my keyboard a little bit too hard. There we go. So here we have 70 sub-regional health authorities or these SRHAs. So there's been a, I, uh, throughout my career, the regions have changed a few times in Alberta. Uh, generally the same sort of building blocks are, are there, but they've been um, reassembled a few different ways. Now we have five zones and within those five zones we have um, local areas and all this kind of stuff, but I'm using um, the geographies that were at the time when we had, I believe, nine regional health authorities that were then divided into 70 sub-regional health authorities. And so as typical with uh, Canadian 
uh, geography and distribution of population. We'll have like a lot of larger geographic cells in the north where it's sort of sparsely populated. And then we'll have um, a lot of smaller geographic areas in our major urban centers like Edmonton and Calgary, which are shown as insets. And so the data I'm going to use is from 2006, 2007, that fiscal year. And I have aggregate data, so my data are aggregated to the, the cells here, these sub RHAs. And I need to know a location for each of the sub RHAs where basically I'm going to put all the cases and all the events into. So I'm going to align them. And I believe that the numbers on the um, map here are the centroid locations. So those are supposed to be the population base. So they may not be right in the middle of a geographic area, but they're where if you weighted the population that lives there, um, uh, then we can we can see. So I do see that there's an audience question and I'll, I'll maybe just jump in because it's a perfect thing. So how were cases events assigned or aggregated to sub RHAs? So this is based on the, the person's um, postal code of residence. So everyone who uh, lives in Alberta has a postal code, has a geographic location, and so they'd be assigned to the, the sub-regional health authority that covers their, their postal code, their geographic position. And the other thing that often we need for these types of analyses is some sort of idea of closeness or uh, spatial relationship among these uh, cells and so sometimes it's nearest neighbors and sometimes uh, it, it's based on uh, other other measurements like if you were doing something where perhaps uh, you wanted to have um, you, you thought that areas are closer to each other if they're along the same highway then you might use a different sort of measurement rather than just where they are from the point of view of their their cell centroid so here's a little bit of a look at the data the sub rhas are um, provided to just go from the numbering that i had which was one to 70 so basically from south to north on the left panel we have what the population is in each of these cells and then we have the number of people that presented to the ED in each of these cells as well as the number of times or the number of events or number of presentations that happen in each of these cells. And so what you can see here is that there's well there's lots of things to see but generally you can see that there's uh, quite a wide variety of um, quite a bit of variation in the population amongst our different sub RHAs. Some are quite large, some are really small, which can be a difficult statistical issue to deal with. Um, then you can also see between the cases and events that it's not necessarily true that the places with the highest number of um, cases will also have the highest number of events. Uh, so there may be different, different use uh, patterns going on in these different areas. So let's talk a little bit about some of the methods. And so in general, um, there's a lot of different tests to identify clusters. And uh, the references that I'm giving are maybe a little bit older, but they're still, I think, really good and good reviews uh, to talk about these different approaches. And there's something called general or focused tests. And generally, you're going to identify uh, a cluster in a geographic area without really looking at any kind of direction, whereas focus tests are identifying um, a cluster around a specific geographic site or some sort of suspected source of contamination or exposure. So one of the things I did in my master's work is that I looked at um, uh, pulp mills in British Columbia and looked at whether or not there was uh, any uh, clustering around pulp mills for a variety of different cancers. I'm going to talk about general methods here. So 
Methods generally will either examine areas with similar population and compare the number of cases or examine areas with similar numbers of cases and compare the population sizes. So that's kind of the two, two flips of the coin. Um, some methods will detect the location of clusters uh, while others can identify areas with a tendency to cluster. And that's kind of like a subtlety that generally we don't have to think about necessarily too, too much, but maybe it's helpful in, in terms of interpretation. And as you saw from my map of the population, we have diverse population sizes. And so um, methods for those kinds of um, data settings are what I'm mostly interested in. And again, there's been a kind of a lot of sort of earlier papers that uh, dealt with these these issues, the ones that I have in bold, B. Newell and Kolder for Nagarwala, uh, the latter being probably the most popular one uh, that's around, um, and I'll, I'll show you why. And uh, again, these are older references, and but they're sort of like the foundation of a lot of this work. And so there's been a lot more publications that have come since that do different um, tweaks or variations or or that kind of thing on this um, uh, total area. And so the idea with these is that they're timely, they're cost effective, and you don't need local reports. Uh, okay, so I did say the definitions again. So for these definitions, we went through already cases, events, and cells. And I guess I wanted to say one more thing about this, that if you have these, um, the, the choice of cell is an important one. Sometimes you don't have a lot of choice because you only have certain geographic areas in your, your region that you can have aggregate data from. That's all sort of chosen by the sort of administrators of systems. Um, if you have them too large, you're not going to be able to find, like too geographically large, you're not going to be able to find smaller clusters because things are going to um, be uh, sort of averaged out and you won't find sort of spikes in cases or events. Also, if they're really large anyways, then you might want to do something like just doing standardized rates or crude rates because you will have enough enough data to do that and have stable denominators. Um, if you don't have, uh, if, you, if you have like a lot of potential cells, like you could almost think of each person as a cell or a very small thing, then you're going to have to do quite a lot of computation, which may not be as much of an issue for that. Um, you can get these kind of uh, combination of cells to become a cluster that maybe don't really make sense geogra geographically. Uh, because they're a very sort of weird shape, but that could happen. Um, but the advantage is if they're smaller, there may not be enough cases in uh, one cell to be considered a cluster because of a relatively small denominator, but maybe in combination with a few other neighbors, then, then you can identify something. So those are kind of the, the issues that you have to think of. Um, and then, uh, basically, we talked about cluster before, so I'll go through. So what do we need for the data? Well, you need to definitely know your population and your geographic location at some point. You need to be able to be to aggregate or have individual level data for both the population and the people with the diseases um, or the illnesses. So an important probably aspect that I should mention here is that while we are talking about emergency department presentations, the, it's not the emergency department that's our geographic unit, and it's not the emergency department that is the, where the aggregation happens for the, the population and for the cases. We use the uh, area of residence because we believe that the, it's, it's not necessarily so important of where the person went to the emergency department. It's actually important of like, well, where was the person living when they um, when they attended an emergency department. Those are uh, some subtleties there. And I mean, we've made the assumption that if you are um, presenting to an emergency department, uh, you know, you could be on, you could be traveling, you could be doing different, different things. And so 
uh, using your your home residence as your location um, seems the most reasonable thing to do here. And you might also have important strata variables for both population and cases. And the key is you need them for population and cases. So if you were going to do something with cancer and you knew, you usually know a whole bunch more data about the cases, you might know things like their, uh, if the person was a smoker or not, or, or various things. But generally, we don't know that at the population level, and usually don't know that at, um, you know, for an individual in the population who has a certain uh, other characteristics, age and sex. So you're sometimes limited in, in how much you can adjust for. And actually, for these results, I'm not going to do any adjustments, although these can be done by age and sex. So I stated a little bit that sometimes we can know exact location, but for most cases, and, and often if you're not uh, within a government system, you can't really know the exact location of a case or a population. So we do aggregate um, these into administrative areas. And one of the sort of key problems that can occur here is that if you have different uh, aggregations, then you have something called the modifiable aerial unit problem, where if you do the same analysis but use different geographic uh, administrative areas, then you might have different results. And it makes complete sense because you're looking at different populations and cases aggregated to different uh, levels. And so when you do these kinds of aggregations, you're changing around the, the spatial relationships as well. So that's not definitely um, a big issue. So one of the things that we do try to avoid is making inferences to individuals. So, you know, if we find an area that has um, more uh, cases than it would ex be expected by chance. It doesn't mean an actual individual in that area has a higher likelihood of becoming a case, right? This is at an aggregated level. So I'll start off by talking a little bit with um, Coldarf and Nagarwala's case. And so this is the, probably the most popular a way to do cluster detection, basically because it's easy to implement, has minimal data. And by easy to implement, I say that uh, pretty early on, there is a website that had software that anyone in the world could download for free to be able to implement this. And this was you know, before the time of our other sort of more shared language statistical packages. Um, so that made it very popular to, to implement. So it searches for cluster locations. It's also called the spatial scan. And the basic idea is that there is a clustered circle where the cases inside the circle um, will have a certain probability or uh, the probability, sorry, let me reset that. Um, the probability of a case being inside the circle is P and that's greater than the probability of the case being outside the circle so that you can split um, the entire region into these two areas inside the circle you have a higher uh, probability of being a case compared to outside the circle so you need like the nearest neighbors or some sort of latitude or longitude for each cell um, and so then basically what you do is you, or the computer does for you, you have variable window sizes that are created and you calculate within each of these um, zones or what they're called, um, how many cases there are compared to the population and you do a likelihood ratio test and, and then have simulations to calculate a p-value. And so I've given the website here of the um, program that actually does this, which is called SatScan. And if you are an R user like I am, then there's actually an R wrapper called R SatScan, which actually doesn't do any of the um, calculations or any of that stuff, but it allows you to, if you have SatScan installed on your computer, then it will basically set up the sort of program to run SatScan, run it in the background for you, 
uh, and then you can use the results. And so this is very handy because for a lot of us who are doing analyses, we're not just wanting to use a canned package. We may want to do a bunch of summaries or do a report, or then once you have these results, put them on a map, all that kind of stuff, right? So the wrapper is quite easy to use, but I would say sometimes it's a little bit fussy. And one of the tips that I would give um, anyone on that is to basically just, um, th there's one really sort of handy thing that you can sort of do in the SatScan SAT -SAN software, sort of select all the options you want, and then sort of look at the script that's generated in the background and make sure that you have the same kind of setting um, for the R wrapper so that you're, you're getting the results you want. Um, so maybe I won't go into too much detail here, but for those who like to see a little bit of math, this is the math behind there. And so basically just for notation's sake, we have these zones Z and so C sub Z is going to be the number of cases in um, zone Z and N sub Z are going to be the number of population. Um, in zone Z. And so basically we try to find um, the area where the likelihood of um, maximize over these possible, all these possible P's and Q's to find the Z that has um, the biggest difference, the biggest difference between P and Q. So that was kind of a lot of description and maybe not very clear. And certainly the math sometimes isn't very clear, but I've just got a little sort of dummy example here where we've got, um, say, a five um, cell region. And so we've got the dots there, which represent the centroids. So that's where I'm basically um, putting all the population and cases for my, my example here. And um, the C1 to C5, those are telling you the number of cases in each of the um, cells. We have a total number of cases of 59. The total population, that's N, is 18,500. And then the population in each cell, N1, cell 1 has 1,000, cell 2 has 500, etc. And so how would we do this? Well, basically, you would start at your first cell and create a circle. And so this circle would include the cases in the population from cell one, and then everything else would, would be um, outside the zone. So for this zone, you would have then um, the ability to test what's the likelihood that the probability of being a case was inside the zone is uh, bigger than the probability of being a case outside the zone. And basically you keep drawing these circles. Um, so the radius increases for these different circles and you keep going, keep going, keep going. And so for each of these circles that you draw for each of the cells, you end up doing a calculation and finding a maximum and all that kind of thing. And so at some point, you would basically decide, you know, include everything. Well, if you if you include everything, then nothing can be potentially a cluster because there'd be nothing outside, and it would be very unlikely to find um, such a high cluster. So we really only allow us to do these circles so that you cover up to a pre-specified amount of population, and often that's something like uh, fifty percent or something like that. So there's a lot of calculations that go on behind. And so that's partly why I said, if you do um, this for a large number, like say, say you had a thousand sub-regional health authorities, well, then you're going to do this for um, a thousand of them times how many ever uh, different circles are produced for each of them um, times your Monte Carlo simulations, and it can get to be quite large and maybe might not be um, very useful. All right, so my examples here is that we're looking at the pediatric population. And so we had about almost 850,000 um, children and about 1,300 cases and 1,400 events. And so um, to do this Kohler's Nagarwala spatial scan, uh, I pulled this from another talk where we used a 7% uh, maximum cluster size population just so we could compare with something else that was much more um, uh, computationally intensive. So 
typically we choose something like 50%. So that's back to the data again to show you what the original data looked like. And this is a little bit of an example of what um, the actual data files would look like is that we would have a population and a case file and a geography file. So uh, it, for the case file, we basically know for each of our geographic regions how many uh, cases there were. And usually you need to put some sort of time element like a year or something like that for the software to work. Similar thing for the population. And then for this example, I'm using the latitudes and longitudes of those um, uh, cell centroids that I showed in the plot. So pretty easy data, easy to generate from administrative sources. If you were actually using the uh, SAT scan software, you would look something like this, where you would tell it where each of your uh, files are and be able to, to tell it what sort of analysis you want to do. And then you get some output that basically looks like this, where it would tell you the location of the uh, clusters. So that's the location ID. So this one says that 61 is there. There's some different options about if you want these clusters to be overlapping or to be um, distinct. And I basically say I want them to be distinct. So it tells me that in sub RHA 61, there are about 12,000 um, children and 58 cases, but we really only expect there to be 18.5 cases based on the overall um, population and the frequency of um, cases in the province. And so you get more details there and then you have a very, very small p-value based on all of these simulations. Uh, then it tells me the next potential cluster is um, 44 and there we had again expected number of cases 43 or sorry the observed number of cases is 43 and the expected is 17. So those would be suggested that we have the probability of being case inside this cluster is a lot higher than the probability of being a case outside the cluster which is what our our test is trying to do. So I've said most of that uh, already in this slide. And then, so then there's this possible secondary clusters. Um, so there were nine identified, but only four had a, a statistically significant uh, p-value from the, all these um, uh, simulation results, Monte Carlo simulation results. So I've numbered them there, but a map is always a better idea. So there we go. We see that, okay, 61 is in this uh, northeastern Alberta area, a more uh, remote and rural area of Alberta. And then I have the rest of the clusters um, that are suggested that were less than 0 0.05. So includes uh, some of the areas in the west and some of the areas in the, the south of the province. So that was based on cases, but what if we wanted to do events? Because certainly the fact that somebody is a case and they presented once may not necessarily identify the people who are really using perhaps more health services and presenting more times and maybe are more severe. And so when we have uh, questions like that and involve health services research, we often have repeated events like um, health visits or tests. And events on the same subject are not going to be independent. And you can just apply the Kaplan or the um, Coldorf Nagarwala spatial scan directly to events. You could just treat like the number of events as if they are people. Um, but that may not be the, the most appropriate. So, uh, work with a postdoc that I did in 2013, we basically did a, an approach that we did a spatial scan, but we used. Um, a, a compound Poisson approach instead that would adjust for the repeated events by a person, so the repeated ED presentations by a child. And so one way to illustrate these kinds of um, uh, what a, a compound Poisson uh, distribution is, is you can think of, uh, say you have a random number of buses that are arriving at a school or an event, and then you have a random number of children 
in each bus. And what you're really interested in is what the total number of children are. So from that perspective, that would be a compound Poisson distribution. So you've got two um, random numbers that are coming in here, random variables that are coming into here. So I think of like, well, each of these bus is a, is a person and each of these uh, little kids is actually each of their presentations to the emergency department. But that's harder to illustrate and this is sort of more fun when you work with pediatrics. All right, so our approach, well, was it was kind of more difficult because we had to have um, closed form or closed form expressions were not available and we used a recursive formula and so we were quite uh, computationally intensive and then we used a different kind of approach to try to improve um, calculations and then I was asked to review a letter to an editor at one point um, where somebody else, Castellaris and colleagues, had basically shown that our random variable had a name and type A distribution uh, which was much faster and it was kind of cute in there they said the well-known you know the the well-known name and type A so name and type A definitely was not well known to myself or um, to uh, the postdoc uh, Chang that I was working with at the time nor was it to a lot of the insurance industry which uh, insurance is a typical sort of application for compound plus on things because you have a number of claims uh, and run a number of people who will make claims and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, it was interesting to see that other people had read this and come up with a solution that was much faster. And I haven't actually implemented it in anything because my life has uh, become more focused on COVID related research uh, now, but it was, it was nice to see a solution to our calculation problem. And so basically we did a C++ program for, for calculations to be able to do that. And so if we do the same type of thing as we did before, but now look at these events and do the sort of appropriate adjustment using a compound, compound Poisson process, we get a little bit different results. So I've plotted these on the map and shown them side by side. So we don't actually identify 61 as the, the area. So it maybe has lots of cases, uh, compared to population in the rest of the, the province, but it doesn't necessarily have as many events. Um, more events are happening in the um, more eastern region. So that might be important for health services. And then if we look at uh, the comparison of these two methods, um, we will see that we our secondary clusters for the event base show sort of the areas around um, uh, sort of Edmonton a little bit north as being the secondary. Now, again, it's not like one of these approaches is right or wrong. They're answering different questions because they're based on different data. Um, but I just wanted to show that, in, you know, if your question is really about health services use and increased um, numbers of presentations, then if you used something just based on cases, maybe you're not getting the, the answer that you want to. Uh, so I'd just like to highlight that are, there are a whole bunch of different um, spatial scans that depend on the data type. If you have point data, you can use a Bernoulli model. If you have multinomial data, multinomial model, um, exponential for survival. So there's a whole bunch of different modifications that focus on different aspects like irregular shapes as well. Like in the, the little mock example I showed you, those are all circles. Well, maybe circles aren't really what you want to use. Maybe you want to use something different. Um, there's ability to also look at purely spatial clusters, a look at spatial temporal. There's a whole bunch of, of things here, but I've just given you kind of a basic, basic introduction of, of things. Um, I'll maybe just go a little bit quickly on the sort of the other area that, that I've worked on, because I also like um, this approach a little bit as well. And again, same kind of thing, easy to implement, minimal data. There are general and focused versions. Um, here, what we believe, again, is that every individual, if it's the null hypothesis you're testing, is that every individual is equally likely to be a case independent of other individuals in the location of their residence. Um, there is basic approach implemented in R using the D cluster package. Um, 
there's more specialized approaches in, in our code as well as a C++ code that has been developed by my team. But I haven't been as good about getting uh, things into a package and certainly not maintaining it. And some of our publications have had code um, published with them. Uh, same idea in terms of we're sort of going to test each cell separately. Um, but we have to decide on what cluster size we want to test. So basically this type of approach will test each cell separately and find um, the number of cells that are needed to be combined with that cell to include this threshold of K cases. And under the null hypothesis, hypothesis this is approximated by the Poisson distribution. So here's my map again. Uh, my little mock example. So say we wanted to do this, we do this in turn for each of the cells, but say I wanted to do it for cell five at this point. Uh, so I've decided my cluster size is 10. So for cell five, I only have two cases, which was less than 10. So I then need to combine with its nearest neighbor, which is cell four, which gives me another additional case. But again, I'm still below that threshold of 10. And I keep going until I've got at least 10 cases. And then once I do that, it's a simple Poisson calculation to be able to figure out a p-value and say, is this um, group of cells a cluster or not, or a potential cluster or not. So you can imagine you do that for each cell. Uh, you're going to have multiple testing issues for sure. So you do Monte Carlo simul simulation. How do you decide what uh, cluster size to choose? Um, that's uh, some work that I've, I've done as well uh, to look at basically using the population within that cluster to help determine what the cluster size should be. And the geographic presentation can be a little bit harder as well. Um, similarly, we could do the same kind of thing for the events if we want to test and do analogously to my spatial scan example using a compound Poisson distribution as well. We need some additional assumptions about the number of events per subject, but we can we can do all of this. So in this case, that same example, instead we've got the V's here instead of the, the cases. And we have to look for a cluster size, which I call in this case K star of a certain number of events. And in this example, I would be able to, to just stop at one cell. So basically that L, if you have to have a large L to be able to ac accumulate the number of events you're using in your cluster size or the number of cases you need for your cluster size, um, then there can't really be any clustering because you've had to go far out to get all the, collect all the cases. If it's small, then you, you may have it already in your, your small neighborhood around and then you are more likely to have a cluster identified. Uh, and so I've done some other sort of approaches or alternatives involving all of these kind of things. And um, in fact, one of the sort of more fun things is we used an exact approach and it, it turned out to be a multiple hypo geometric distribution because what it, it ends up being is like you're trying to find what are all the ways that you can get to these certain number of events and you've got as I illustrated before you've got people but then you've also got the events each has and I sort of akin this to um, like money you know maybe you want to get a dollar there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get to a dollar with the change that you have in your hand right um, you know made up of pennies and dimes and nickels and quarters right you have to sort of enumerate all those possibilities and that's kind of the same same thing that we applied here uh, so if we do the same, all the same good stuff, uh, we find that we have uh, 30 sub-regional health authorities that are identified as clusters, some that are just by themselves and some that are in combination uh, with that. And then we know that that would be highly unlikely to have occur, occur with just by chance, because if we do a whole bunch of simulations that distribute the the cases um, in accordance with the, the rate of the entire province, we, we didn't find that in, in any of our simulation studies. 
So you can provide a table of results like this, which is a little bit maybe cumbersome to look at, but it's a little bit different than a spatial scan because here you're looking at each cell individually in combination with its neighbors, and we can identify those important things. But of course, really we would like to plot things. And so on the right-hand side here, I have our events-based approach using the same data and plotting I believe the red are the ones that are um, clusters on their own, and then the orange had to be combined with a neighbor to be a, a cluster. So definitely it's a little bit harder to plot because we have, um, it's hard to plot things that might be overlapping. Uh, but in general, we have sort of similar results, I would say, to what was, was shown for the event space under the Koldorf and Nagawala approach, well, that we adapted to at that. Uh, so just some final slides here and then I'll wrap up. So interpretation. Well, results can differ for cases and events. That's okay. So you may have some areas that have more children and youth with um, presentations to the ED than expected. And some areas may have more substance use presentations. So the areas of excess substance use um, presentations, like what could, what could be causing that or what's what, what do we really say about that? So it, when we're doing health services research, there's then possible, many possible explanations, right? So we may have some differences in the important factors that aren't adjusted for. So perhaps age and sex or, or some other aspect, um, socioeconomic status, that kind of thing. Um, there's access to health services that may differ, like a more rural area may not have uh, clinics available after hours or some other care services. So is it really that there are more uh, people who need emergency care who are um, in that rural area or is it just because they have less access to services, right? Some may have more um, children and youth that have more severe, severe illness. So I think we have to be very careful in how we interpret these uh, results when thinking of events and is it really about the condition or is it about the access to the health services? And these analyses can't answer that all in one way. Um, but we would need to do some further uh, epidemiological investigations to be able to figure out if these clusters are real or not. And if they're real, you can maybe do something about them, interventions, um, other resources, that kind of thing. And I think one of the you know, easy things about using administrative data for this kind of purpose is that you can repeat these analyses you know, relatively frequently to see if things are, are changing over time. Uh, are you seeing higher than expected numbers in one year or another? Uh, so in conclusion, I'll just say that uh, statistical cluster detection is easy to implement, I would say, <laughs> pretty easy, and requires minimal data. Uh, that scan provides an easy platform, that's for sure. And you may have results that differ between cases and events and for different methods. You have to carefully uh, look at those differences and see if you can understand them and what uh, analysis best answers your research question. And definitely statistical cluster detection is a first step that can target a more detailed analysis. And of course, there's a lot of spatial modeling, spatial temporal modeling things that do a lot more uh, require perhaps a lot more assumptions and would be maybe more suitable for some of the questions you have. But if you just want to identify these areas um, for higher, and I should say you could also do for lower um, numbers as well, then that's very helpful. And my final slide, or I think my final slide, I'd just like to thank the organizers again. Uh, I have had great support from our funding agencies and from people at Alberta Health for data and great collaborators. So with that, I will stop. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, thanks so much, uh, Rhonda, for an excellent presentation. We really appreciate uh, your time and willingness to uh, to provide information. I think a number of people probably haven't had a lot of geospatial experience, so uh, it's great to have this presentation as part of our advanced method series. Uh, we do have a few questions. So uh, first one is uh, looking at the data from both urban and rural areas, does the stat, SAT scan model account for population density in any way? Yes, so that's right. So in all of those uh, calculations, 
there would be a um, basically the ratio, sort of the cases to population. And so that's one of the reasons that I use these methods is because of the disparity of population, the diversity of population sizes amongst generally these regions. So I need something to adjust for that. I couldn't just say I want to use a method that looks at solely the number of cases the populations are involved here too. Great, thank you. And another uh, question, what is the estimation approach of uh, SAT scan model um, and does it consider uh, a Bayesian or frequency approach? Right, so that's a really good question too. Um, yes, these are, I don't know if there's a Bayesian option in there. there I think there might be. Uh, most of these are likelihood approaches and using maximum likelihood estimation. And like the example that I gave where we're just looking at sort of a Poisson sort of situation, the likelihood is easy to write down and easy to, to calculate. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, quite a few different settings and it could very well have that implemented as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, we've got a few minutes left. <laughs> I know that you, um, you had lots of uh, great sort of charts and uh, as you said, some of the math behind what you did. I don't know if um, if you're able to share your slide deck. Sometimes, um, I, I mean, there's, there's things that you don't want to share, but um, we always ask that question simply because of some of the content that you have. Yeah, I'm happy to share that. And that's partly why I use the um, this older data and the results, because those are already published in various papers and that type of thing. And so that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to share that with anyone who'd like that. I'm happy to, um, people can contact me. I don't know, um, yeah, contact sure. me directly or through you or whatever, that's fine. That'd okay, that would be great, sure. And we can maybe uh, just post that below the recording. If people want further information, they can contact you directly yeah yeah perfect 